welcome everybody. Uh, so this is um, just, it's a beginning ham radio series. Uh, we'll have it every week uh, for the foreseeable future um, to get people started. Um, everybody's welcome. So if you've been in ham radio for a number of years, you can certainly help answer questions that other people have. Um, and this, this is sponsored by the Portland Amateur Radio Club. Uh, we are a ham radio club in Portland. Um, we encourage you to attend our, our free meetings uh, that happen every month. And um, I'll send you some more email information about that. Uh, it's free to everybody. Um, we do have some great speakers uh, every month. All right, so just kind of a real quick uh, check-in or introductions. Um, if you guys want to uh, just let us know uh, what your name is, a call sign if you have one, how did you find out about ham radio, and then what interests do you have or what are you currently doing in ham radio? And again, my name is Max K2MAX, um, and I found out about ham radio about 30 plus years ago, I think from a family member because uh, one of our family friends actually is uh, was a ham radio operator and had a very nice HF setup. Um, and at the time, you had to know Morse code even just to get your novice license. Um, and so eventually at 15, I did that. And then uh, I have a pretty wide interest in ham radio, anything from voice to Morse code to um, digital modes, um, some contesting, but also um, just um, talking with people that are in the ham community and learning more about it. So that's it for me. Anybody else want to to introduce themselves? Greg Wennison. Um, I'm down in Oak Grove between Gladstone and Milwaukee. I'm the uh, the lead for the uh, uh, Oak Grove or Oak Lodge CERT, which is the equivalent to NET. We've got about 12 hams in our group. Um, or 12 people with licenses. Let's clarify that versus a ham. <laughs> and um, I'm interested, so I've been licensed for about uh, 12, 13 years. I got it as part of search and rescue training down in Mendocino County. And uh, um, I've got, I don't know, th three or four radios and HF, uh, mostly Yesu um, uh, gear. I'm interested in emergency comms and digital. Oh, very good. Thanks, Greg. Hey, Jesse. Oh, I'm here. Hey, Max. How are you? Good. Good. Well, um, again, my name's Jesse Chiquette. I put my call sign up there, which is which is brand new, uh, KJ7SCP. Congratulations. Recently. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, took my technician um, exam about two weeks ago and currently studying for my general right now, hoping to get that completed sometime in uh, February. Uh, my dad's been in ham radio since the 70s, and so I've always had an interest in this um, just for years, and finally just pulled the trigger on it and decided to dive in and, and make it happen. And so he's got a general license. He's up in Washington. So our whole goal now is to try to figure out the whole repeater system to talk to each other. Um, I'm, I'm down in Sherwood, Oregon, and so um, that's kind of how I found out about it, and then just did some research working from home and started hitting the books and took a took a class with the organization back east virtually and did a bunch of online studying and um, got the got the technician one completed. Um, my interests right now are just just learning as much as I can. It's pretty fascinating diving into all this stuff and learning about all the electrical stuff that I couldn't stand in college. And so I'm kind of revisiting my, my biggest fear of college, learning all these <laughs> equations again. And so it's been a lot of fun. So I'm, I'm hoping just to continue on through all the levels of the licensing eventually. Um, but I, I just, I don't know where to start. So I guess that's why I wanted to jump on. I, I have the uh, a, a $20 radio I bought online. And to be honest with you, I don't even know what to do with it. And so <laughs> I'm, I'm just looking for some help on where to start with, you know, a base station and frequencies even to listen to. Um, and then, you know, I'd ultimately like to get into or get involved in some search and rescue stuff. We did some of that in Civil Air Patrol uh, years ago, um, but that's always been an interest of mine too. So that's, that's kind of a little bit about me. That's awesome, Jesse. Thank you very much and congratulations. Yeah, thank you. This hey, is Jim. I'm from yeah, um, 
Molalo, and I got started about uh, 56 years ago. Uh, and the reason I got started, my family had an old uh, record player with an AM transmitter on it. It had no uh, speaker, so you had to tune an AM radio to a specific <laughs> frequ frequency, and you could hear what the record player was playing. So in high school, I studied and got my uh, novice license, and I think I can even remember the first rigs that uh, I operated, which I still had them, but uh, my interest is to find a way to get new hams over the over the hurdle get them passing their tests and uh, also to help them find uh, serviceable equipment that's that's great jim and thank you very much for joining i think you're going to be a great asset to this group hi uh, yeah um i'm shane dowling uh, my wife and my daughter are here as well we've been interested in learning ham radio for hello there the preparedness aspect. Um, I first really found out about it. I mean, I'd heard off about it off and on, but I really saw how useful it was. Um, I was in the National Guard. I got mobilized for going down to New Orleans following Katrina, and all the comms went out because um, we didn't bring our heavy equipment. It was going to be sent down to us by a train. We just flew in there. And so we're, you know, oh, we'll, we'll use cell phones, not realizing the towers had died because the batteries went bad. But the first day we were there, a ham showed up in a cheap Grand Cherokee um, and his rigs. And so we set him up with a table at our headquarters and he was our contact with the outside world for two weeks. And ever since then, it's been a goal of mine to learn. And uh, I mean, I used to hold the MOS for radio telephone operator as well, um, but that's a totally different breed of cat. So, but uh, amateur radio, you know, been interested in it for a long time. So here I am. That's great. Are you studying for your test now? Working on it. Yeah, slowly. Okay. Uh, I've great. got a couple of friends who are, one's got his general license, the other one's got his technician's license, and they're both studying for promotion. Um, so I'm picking their brains as well. Oh, that's great. And we live, God, less than a mile from the ham radio outlet on Pacific Highway. So <laughs> that place is evil. Yes, it is. You can drop a lot of money there. Yeah. The candy store. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Shane. Uh, uh. I'm Herb Wiener, um, AA7HW. Um, I first got into ham radio uh, uh, in the 60s, but uh, basically I sold all my equipment uh, to go to college and let my license lapse, and I've really only been uh, back into it for a few years. Uh, but I'm spending a huge amount of time as a volunteer examiner. We're administering exams uh, remotely. Oh, about five, six times a week. So. Thanks, Herb. Yeah, and if you are interested in, in getting your uh, licensed uh, and testing, uh, Herb is the one that you would want to talk with. Wait, David, I think you're muted on your end. How about now? All right, sorry about that. Um, David, uh, KJ7DLN, uh, I've been licensed for a little over a year, but really haven't um, done too much with it. I've been coming to the monthly meetings, which I think have been excellent and trying to learn as much as I can. And um, I've been studying for the uh, general exam because um, I think I pretty rapidly realized that I need, I think that next level to sort of get into some of the HF. Um, and Right now, I just have a, a, a Yesu FT70D, just a VHF UHF and a handheld. And um, I've been really wanting to come to this group, and I'm really glad you're putting this together because I'm really interested in learning about, um, you know, an antenna. And you know, it seems like I need to put, be putting a lot of effort into that as well as creating the first, you know, base station or, or my home station, and then. Um, you know, I live in the city. I'm in Southeast Portland, and I'm not in an HOA, but I'm sure there still are some restrictions. They're trying to figure out how I can 
maximize what I can do and um, still be with within reason with my neighbors. Uh, and so um, looking forward to that and probably getting in touch with Herb about setting up the testing. I just need to finally, I think, just set a date and commit to it so I can just get the, the general out of the way. Thanks. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. And if you are interested in um, HF or long distance uh, communication, um, the general definitely is the way to go. That would give you almost all the frequencies uh, amateur radio has available. Um, and we can definitely help you with the antenna and the base station ideas. So thanks, David. So for Anybody? what it's worth, I put my website in the chat uh, that has information on uh, um, the online exams as well as other useful information. Thanks, Herb. And, and I did maybe I caught this at the very beginning. Did did I understand correctly that the FCC just changed their fee schedules? And does anyone know when that's actually effective? It's effective 30 days after the regulation is published, and I don't believe it's been published yet. So. Cool. Anybody else want to? Uh, so for those of you who just joined, um, uh, my name is Max, and this is going to be kind of an informal group uh, that we'll meet weekly. And uh, we're kind of just doing some introductions now. I have some uh, questions for everybody coming up, but if anybody else wants to introduce themselves, um, just let us know what your name, your call sign, if you have one. Jay? Hi, Max. Hey, Jay. This is, this is Jay uh, Wilt. I, uh, my call sign is WA7IRN. And that was my original call sign going back to um, in the uh, 60s. So I had a similar story. I was totally consumed by ham radio in my younger days. The thing I liked about it was building equipment and testing it and antennas and testing them and uh, uh, chasing DX and field day, collecting QSL cards. My last QSL card for worked all states was W A one I R N, and I knew I, I knew he would send it, <laughs> me a card since his his uh, suffix matched mine. But I uh, when I went to college, I kind of got out of it, and then uh, I met Dan Wesley at the uh, net meetings, and Dan kind of got me inspired again, and. I haven't, haven't really been too active, but I do have a, a Yesu handheld and I don't know much about the um, repeaters or two meters or any of that, but I'd like to be helpful in that capacity. But there's this other part of me that is itching to, to build something, my, <laughs> a receiver or a transmitter or something. My problem is similar to somebody that mentioned about the HOA. I live in a condo and it's, um, I'm a little worried about uh, impacting my neighbors. Yeah, we can uh, talk a little bit about that. I know uh, several of the people in the Portland Amateur Radio Club do live um, downtown Portland in, in uh, apartments or condos. Um, there are some definitely good ways to kind of get around that, um, either stealth antennas uh, or even just remote operating. Um, Dan, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about uh, soda summits on the air. That's a great way to kind of just get out of the apartment or condo and uh, go to some place that has a really good um, reception and uh, ability to talk to other people. So thanks, Jay. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to introduce themselves? Sure, I will. Hi. It's Diane Marr, and uh, I'm a Portland net. And I got my license this year, uh, really tough test, but I like a challenge and there was a lot of help and I love the community. Um, I, but I find that um, for me, I don't really know what to do next. And I'm mostly interested in um, preparedness for any kind of um, emergency for my family, for my neighbors. And so I'd like to, you know, to figure out how to how to use the equipment that I have and how to if I need to upgrade it before there's an emergency. That's great. Thanks, Diane. Uh, 
I, more and more people are getting into ham radio for that exact same reason. And we got a couple of people um, on that uh, Bruce, I think, um, is very familiar with uh, emergency preparedness. Um, did you want to uh, give a little bit of background, Bruce? Sure. Um, if, you, if you've got a visual on me, you can see uh, I'm old enough to have been doing this for a while. <clears throat> But it's really uh, my third ham radio career. I, I did Morse code stuff when I was 15. Um, I did a lot of uh, 10 meter international uh, voice uh, when 10 meters was hot in the 80s. And then the last three years, I've been uh, heavy into mostly uh, VHF and UHF emergency preparedness. And uh, recently, that's involved some 60 meter work as well. Um, reason I'm here tonight is uh, as part of the Portland Net program, I've been involved with a great group of people doing training um, and testing. And uh, so I, I want to learn how I can help. Thank you very much. All right, you don't have to introduce yourself if you don't want to. Anybody else want to go before we go to the questions? Yeah, this is Kurt Goins. KJ7RZA, uh, got my ticket about the 1st of November and I've uh, been playing in the two meter, 70 centimeter stuff. Started with a Balfang, you know, your $35 <coughs> goodie and uh, invested in a uh, X50 diamond uh, vertical for the house. So even with the five watt out of the radio that they advertise, um, I can I can get out a little ways. And then I found a used FTM 400 XDR <clears throat> for $300, <clears throat> excuse me. And I'm using that as my, my fully licensed base, if you will. Um, it'll do 50 watts. And I picked up the, uh, the programming software, what is it, the RTS stuff, RT systems, and loaded it up with uh, frequencies and call signs. Uh, Santa was good to me this year. Uh, I now have a Yesu 991A, um, a shack in the box, if you will, um, that I'm sharing the two meter antenna with, um, working toward my, my general. Um, and Santa also brought me a um, Anytone 878 for DMR. And I'm kind of in the middle of, I mentioned candy store earlier when you, about HRO. And it's like a kid walking into a candy store and you, okay. everywhere you look, there's something you want to try. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, I've been able to get uh, Echo Link up on my computer. Um, I've got to do an FT8 on two meters, which doesn't do a whole lot. <laughs> Not many people out there doing FT8 on two meters, but I'm, I'm just trying to get a handle on everything and see where I want to go. Um, I have other, had other expensive um, hobbies and uh, it's been, uh, I've decided to change to another expensive hobby if you go all out, it can be, you can get along with the $35 radio and a rubber duck, or maybe put a, a mag mount on the car and hook it up to that. And you got a pretty good little setup. Um, but I want to eventually get into the HF stuff and just, to, just looking, trying to figure out where I want to go. So that's awesome. And I'm yeah, out here in Gresham. I'm, and I'm out here in Gresham. Gresham. Okay. Yeah, so Kirk made a, a couple of great points. Um, number one, if money's no object, uh, the Yesu 991A radio is a great base station, both HF and VHF. Um, it Ham radio can get expensive uh, if you just buy everything off the shelf. Although the great thing is that it can be one of the, uh, it can be a, a very inexpensive hobby too, especially if um, you stay in it for a year or two, you can start picking up uh, radios and antennas um, for next to nothing, especially once swap meets start uh, meeting back up again. So um, I would definitely say don't, don't get intimidated. Um, ham radio really is a, a hobby of many hobbies. Um, 
it's not just one thing. Uh, so there are parts of ham radio I've never even tried. Uh, and I'm sure there's parts I've never even heard about. Um, but it's just a really great uh, all around hobby that people who are interested in all sorts of things can get in, interested in. So um, by doing these introductions, we're kind of finding out uh, some people are interested in emergency frequency or emergency preparedness, other people HF radio, um, and they're not necessarily uh, mutually exclusive. So cool. Anybody else want to uh, introduce themselves before we move on? Hi, this is Rich Bader. I just joined. Hey, Rich. Yeah, we're just going through introductions. Hey, Max, my timing is good then. This yeah. is Hi, Rich. It's been a long time. Who's that? Jay. Jay Will. Hey, Jay. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. <laughs> nice to see you here. Uh, so this is uh, N7 R&D, November 7, Romeo, November, Bravo, logging in. Uh, hey, can you, uh, can you see our slide that we have up? I can. Yes, thank okay. you. And I see video and hopefully you see me. That's great. Thank you very much, Rich. You bet. Max, nice to meet you. I can introduce myself. Um, Hi, Sue. Uh, yes, my name is Sue. I'm sorry to be a little late. Otherwise known as a Kilo Juliet 7 Sierra Charlie Bravo. I got my um, license in the beginning of November. It was sort of um, serendipity because I have been a member of the neighborhood emergency team uh, in Selwood for a long time. And in October, I just needed something to occupy my mind. And so... <laughs> I took the net cram course and successfully passed the technician license. Um, I've used radios and repeaters a little bit as an outdoor um, work for the National Park Service and as a ski patroller. And so I was a little curious anyway and wanted to have a productive use of my time in the pandemic. There are things that I can't do right now. And so I'm trying to focus my energies on things I can do, like learn how to more about radios in the event of an emergency. And I've checked in a couple of times to um, the nets for the, the emergency um, teams, as well as Multnomah County Aries. Um, and so a big part of my interest is in being comfortable using uh, ham radio as well as GMRS in um, an emergency situation. And I, I bought a little handheld FT60, it's a Yesu, and um, a little diamond antenna to give it a little more oomph. I don't, because, and that, I bought that based on the recommendations of my neighborhood emergency team. Um, Mm, so what I would really like to do is just find people to practice with on simplex. I think I and learn more about the electronics. I'm not a science person by, de, um, by degree, but um, I really enjoyed studying for the technician exam because I learned so much um, electronics, just basic electronics that was great. So um, I want to make good use of this new tool that I have and meet other people who can help me enjoy it. Um, the last thing I'll say is somebody in my neighborhood emergency team let me know about something called like summits on the air or something, maybe soda summits on the <laughs> air. Um, so I'm curious about that, but I just have not had time. I've been so busy um, with other work that I have to do that I, but so that's a little bit of background about me and now I'll be quiet. That's great Sue, thank you very much. And um, yeah, I, finding people to practice with is a, a great goal because you, we can buy all the equipment and study all the books, but then at the end of the day, unless you start putting it into use, it's still gonna be um, kind of like a foreign language. Uh, so this is a great um, weekly uh, session that we'll have. Uh, that hopefully we can um, pair you up or you can find people. Another way to kind of get practice um, is just hanging out with people uh, who are talking about ham radio. Uh, Portland Amateur Radio Club is a great um, resource for that. We do have a few um, yearly events, uh, field day in end of June being one of them that is great cool. for practicing um, the radio skills, both HF and VHF. 
So thank you very much for coming and, and letting us know what you're up to. I think it was Dan. I'm just trying to think who told me about this. It was Dan. I'm looking up his email here from my neighborhood emergency team. I just can't find his last name quickly, but he was the one who told me about soda as well. Uh, yeah. Sue. Oh, there you are. This sorry, is- Dan. I'm so yeah. sorry. Oh, yeah. No, no problem. No. Uh, I couldn't yeah, remember your uh, last name. <laughs> that's fine. It's it's Presley, just like Elvis. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, and I'll I'll talk a, a bit about soda and some of the VHF and HF activities. Also, wanted to say hi to Jay, and I think Jay, it's your birthday, right? Happy birthday! Another Selwood Net. So we got we got a few Selwood Net people on here. And yeah. Jay, it must be tough to be what fifty five. Uh, yeah, I wish I was. <laughs> Try 68. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got, you I got my uh, license when I was 11 years old in Corvallis. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's great. <laughs> uh, Max, uh, why don't we let anybody else introduce themselves and then, you know, whenever it's appropriate, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and, you know, uh, do my thing. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, Max, now that I see your slide, would you like a, a slightly more complete intro from me? Yeah, go ahead, Rich. Uh, uh, so I was a SWL when I was a teenager, uh, wanted to get my ham radio license, but uh, Morse code and tune circuits were two uh, technical obstacles at the time. Uh, fortunately, they've gone away l- largely, and um, I didn't really do, haven't done anything uh, with radio uh for decades. And uh, with the pandemic and emergency services and all of that, it piqued my interest. And uh, so I I had a little time on my hands. The challenge was getting uh, my general. So I took the technician and general uh, test the same day, passed both, uh, got my vanity call sign. Uh, One of my friends, you may know John Beeston, he's active in the emergency service world. Um, and uh, he loaned me a radio. I've done a couple of check-ins, and that's been about it. Uh, I, ha- I have to say, I-, I haven't been feeling as social as I usually do, so, you know, reaching out to strangers and doing all that has been uh, a little more of a burden than usual, but uh, I'm delighted that you guys have organized this. <clears throat> I'm interested in, in what the ham radio scene is all about. I've got a couple of friends with Jay and Bruce Schaefer, folks that I've known for quite a while, that I see on the meeting, which is great. And uh, I know a couple of other hams in the area. So there is a little community around me, Uh, but getting involved with emergency services and all that is one of the things that's on my agenda. And I'm certainly curious to hear what else the club does. So thanks for all that. Thank you very much, Rich. Congratulations on getting your license. Thanks. It's a license to learn. Exactly, (laughs) the license to learn. Now now comes the fun part, right? Yes. Awesome. Thanks, Rich. Anybody else want to introduce themselves before we move on? Yeah. Hi, I, I'm uh, Dick Oshani. I'll correct that name in a, in a few minutes. I, um, I, I'm concerned that uh, so many experts in this group If this, uh, well, let me start out by saying I, I got my license in 2014 and I haven't learned a thing how to use it operate it. I have put it in, it barely had been out of the box. I bought a Yesu uh, radio. I also bought the BTEC. I've, I've got everything. It's still in the box. And uh, it's my own uh, situation that I got really busy with my work. Uh, my, uh, Portland Net, uh, Selwood also, uh, when I show up there, have not had time to commit to any of that, but am making more of a commitment to do all of it for emergency preparation. And hopefully the, uh, the beginning level of where I would like to hear things start out as a refresher anyway, uh, is not too time consuming and boring for the experts, but uh, at the same time, it could go well over my head and I might not be able to follow along. So a little concern about the levels of how you're going to pull this off with so many <laughs> good people knowing what they're doing. And, and I haven't heard that many people that are at kind of my refresher level. But uh, with that, I will keep it short and, and yield the time to the people that need to speak. 
Well, thank you for that introduction. Yeah, I, we're so this is going to be kind of designed as the beginning level. Um, people will have to kind of remind us if we do start going over your head. Uh, although ham radio is a little bit like that. Don't worry if you uh, something goes over your head because just even hearing it and knowing that it, the term is out there or that the concept is out there, oftentimes is just one of the steps in, in learning something new. Um, what we're, our primary goal is, of course, to get, you know, people up and running, getting on the air is a really good goal because that kind of not only keeps you interested, uh, but also um, is kind of the point of getting the licenses to get you on the air. So uh, we'll, we'll try our best to do that. All right. At least I'm getting started before my license expires. <laughs> That's awesome. Also, so will this fee that you're talking about, well, is it when you renew or is it whenever this gets passed? So it will have to be passed first. Um, that'll be sometime next year if it actually goes into effect. Uh, and it's any time that you kind of make changes to your record, whether it's a new license or renewal an address change. Uh, the whole thing is kind of unfortunate and unnecessary uh, in my opinion, but uh, that being aside, um, hopefully it's not gonna be too much of a hurdle uh, for people. And um, we're talking about the $35 um, <laughs> FCC charge for uh, changing records. So uh, Max, I understand it has been passed. It has not been published yet. So after they pass things, they have to publish a notice. So my okay. understanding is it's, it's imminent. Uh, 30 days after they publish the notice, it goes into effect. Okay. And there are still a lot of questions uh, for example, if you get a new license, who's going to collect the fee? Is it going to be the uh, the VEC? Is it going to be a separate fee payable to the FCC? There's a lot of questions we don't know yet. No, that makes sense. Thank you. All right. Anybody else want to introduce themselves? If not, we'll go to... Um, oh, uh, one... Uh, I wanted just to mention the Portland Amateur Radio Club. If you aren't a member, um, you can still attend the club meetings. Uh, everybody that signed up for tonight, I'll add you to the, the list, the email list um, of the uh, emails that get sent out. If you get tired of the emails, uh, you can feel free to um, unsubscribe. There's an unsubscribe link at the bottom, uh, but realize that if you do that, I don't have two separate lists for this group and the Portland Amateur Radio Club. So you would be unsubscribing from this group to uh, at least the notifications. Um, but anyway, if you wanna to go to their website, www.w7lt.org, there's some information there on the, the meeting times um, and some other stuff. It's a great group of people. We meet on Zoom now. Um, uh, someday we will get back to in-person meetings. Uh, we probably will keep the Zoom portion uh, because it's just very convenient for people not have to drive up to uh, to North Portland. Um, but we do have a lot of great speakers. We try to keep them at kind of a mid-level ham radio, uh, not too technical and not too basic. So please feel free to join uh, any of those meetings. You don't have to be a member to join. We just encourage you if you if you find it useful to please uh, join the Portland Amateur Radio Club. So our weekly topic this week is kind of like the first radio to buy. And I know that a lot of you are already licensed. You probably already have your radio. Um, so, which is great. Uh, we can talk about like what you have, what you like and what you don't. There's a lot of um, variables when it comes to buying your first, second, third radio. Um, what you want to do with it, um, how much you know money you want to put out on your first radio, uh, mobile versus handheld is a big concept. And somebody brought up a they had a handheld radio, but a an external antenna. A um, couple of people, I think, and it actually is a great idea to have an external antenna, something that you can mount on your balcony on your rooftop, if you can uh, get up there. Um, there are a lot of different types of external antennas, um, some that you can build yourself uh, for not a lot of money uh, and some that you can buy for starting at about $50 and going on up. Um, it is probably one of the best investments, whether or not you have a mobile or a handheld radio. Um, it is required if you have a mobile radio, you don't want 50 watts um, going into a rubber duck antenna, um, but it does, um, 
it really improves both your reception and your transmitting range if you have an external antenna. And then the, the other big thing that's come up is kind of like a brand name versus a Chinese import, Baofeng, um, and some other radios are Chinese imported. And they, I would say in the last three to four years have actually become a lot better. Um, I think when they first started um, being uh, sold here in the US, they weren't very reliable. They were you know, typically 25 to $35. Um, and I heard a lot of uh, issues with them. I don't hear that much anymore. I'm not certain I would want it to be my only radio, uh, especially in an emergency, but I think it's a very good uh, way to start out if you're not sure. Um, it's sort of like, you know, moving into a new town. You don't want to buy a house right away. You'd like to rent something. That's a great way to rent. So before we go on, I'd like to just uh, for <clears throat> kind of getting a pulse of like where people are and I got to find my meeting controls. Give me just a second. They're hiding here somewhere. Uh, I'll do a um, kind of a poll. Uh, feel free to um, answer any and all questions. And then we'll show the results after after you're done. <clears throat> Anybody not see the poll that I just launched? I can see it. Cool. Hey, Max. Yeah. While you're uh, um, kind of collating and stuff there, like I said, I've got, uh, I, I lead a group of 30 uh, some folks uh, for CERT, and I've got about 12 operators, or excuse me, like I said, licensed people rather than operators. Um, so I'm going to point them at this right here. I'm kind of in here checking out to see what's going on, and it looks good. One of the good things I already got already was. Uh, um, the remote uh, remote exams because I've got a couple of folks that uh, want to take it uh, but didn't know how to do it. Yeah, that's great, uh, Greg. Um, Herb has been doing a really good job of uh, doing weekly tests. Um, so fortunately, even though I don't think anybody's doing in-person tests anymore, um, at least not right now, um, but these online tests are just so convenient um, that it really makes it easy, at least on, on that front, to uh, to get your license. The other thing I wanted to mention, um, Greg, is that uh, I, I don't know if you know um, Dale uh, Harris over at Willamette yep. View. Yep. He's actually um, encouraging people over there to uh, check into your weekly net. Okay. So you may have, yeah, you may have a few new people. Yeah. 147.47. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Third, so that's Tuesday and Thursday. We may go to just one day a week, but on the, the third Tuesday, we run the uh, WARC, uh, WRC uh, uh, repeaters. Same oh, thing. yeah. Seven, third, third Tuesday. Okay. Um, uh, who's the gentleman from Oak Grove? I, I missed his name. Oh, Greg. Greg, Greg Wenison. Great. Oh, uh, uh, great. This is... Uh, Dan in 7CQR. There's a bunch of us up in Saltwood. And, oh. uh, you know, you guys aren't all that far away. So no. I would love to try to, uh, you know, establish some sort of uh, back and forth, if nothing else, for radio exercises or coordination because, uh, you know, Oak Grove is closer to Selwood than many parts of the city of Portland. Yep. I'll go ahead and pull so, at our, uh, our schedule and yeah. Super. 
Yeah, I'll relay that to the rest of the show. We've got about, oh, at least 15, 16 licensed dams up here in Solwood. And uh, we're also sitting up a, a, a GMRS repeater. So that may, that may be of interest to you. Yeah, that's great. And for those of you who are kind of new um, or wanting to practice uh, getting using your equipment, um, a net is uh, basically it's just a time and a frequency uh, that's you know designated to for everybody to check in. So basically, using your radio then to uh, practice. Um, it does several things, um, especially for the emergency preparedness people. It makes sure that you know. They, they find out very quickly who can hear whom and who can't hear. Uh, it does things like make sure you know how to use your radio, um, that your batteries are charged, uh, or you think your batteries are charged and they're old and, and you only uh, transmit maybe the first couple of words before the batteries die. So these are, uh, net is an opportunity for everybody to kind of practice using their equipment. And if you haven't participated in one yet, I highly recommend it. Um, there's nets that go on every day of the week on just about every band uh, from HF to VHF, UHF. So um, give it a try. And if you need information on like what is your local net, if you're in Portland, the Portland uh, net, uh, and I apologize, I don't remember what the net stands for, um, but uh, it's a group of people who are interested in or practice uh, emergency uh, preparedness. Um, and then here in Clackamas, I don't know if anybody's in Clackamas, we have several nets a week for our um, ARIES, which is the Amateur Radio Emergency Services. So feel free to send me an email um, if you have any other questions or want to get hooked up with uh, a net. So I'm going to, I'll go ahead and share the results of the poll. So our first one, uh, are you currently licensed ham radio operator? So about 83%, 15 said yes. Um, and can you guys can see the, the numbers of people and the percentages? Negative. And three, cool, and three are not. So that's great. Um, you know, for those three, uh, definitely want to help you get licensed if that's something that you're interested in. And for those of you who are licensed already, definitely our goal is to get you on the air, get practicing, um, and just get some more information if you have a specific area of ham radio that you would like to know more about. Uh, our second question, do you have a ham radio? Uh, looks like most people have at least a VHF, UHF handheld, which is what most people purchase first when they get into ham radio. Uh, VHF, UHF mobile is great, um, simply because uh, handheld is only going to get you about eight, uh, five to eight watts. Um, and with a rubber duck, the little antenna that sits on top of it, it it's great for outdoors. Um, if you're indoors, especially in concrete building, it doesn't get you very far. It may not even get you to your local repeater. Um, that's where the external antenna comes in. HF radio, it looks like uh, five of you have an HF radio um, and three of you do not have any radio at all. And our third question, what beginning ham radio series? Oh, here's a the, the reason I asked this, like if the Thursday at six o'clock would work is because I know the Portland net has something going on Wednesday at six o'clock and apologize for uh, scheduling over that. Try to, you know, not conflict with anything. So we're thinking about switching this particular meeting to Thursday at um, six o'clock. Uh, and if that works for the majority of you, which it looks like it does, um, then I'll go ahead and switch that over. And this next question was kind of a multiple choice. You could pick more than one. It looks like everybody's interested in emergency communications, which is um, a great reason to get into ham radio. Uh, stay connected with family. We have a few. HF radio, about half of you are interested in that, which is great. Um, learning about electronics, 56% uh, said that they're interested in that. Ham radio is great uh, because not only just the test, has some very basic electronic theory on it, but um, ham radio is still a great way to do a lot of tinkering and hacking and just building your own gear. Uh, whether that's from scratch, whether you actually, you know, break open the books and learn from A to Z how to build a radio, or 
another great option is simply a kit building to where somebody's already done a lot of that work for you and your job is to kind of just solder some things together uh, and get on the air that way. Um, Those Heath kits are just awesome. Yes. Yeah, Heath kit, and uh, they've kind of come back a little bit. And there's some... I was making yeah. a, a, an old, what I thought was an old time joke. I didn't know they were still around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they, I think they've uh, released a clock now that you can um, build. And the plan was that they were going to, to um, issue some other kits. But there's some great other kits. Uh, um, QRP guys, uh, if you just um, Google QRP guys, they have a lot of kits that you can make. And for HF radio, you can take a look at uh, the QCX radio. Uh, that's one from QRP Labs. Uh, I think it's about $50 and you put it together. Now, here's the unfortunate part about it. It is uh, Morse code only. So you would have to learn a little bit of code, but that's actually not uh, that difficult to, to do, especially if you're only talking five to 10 words a minute. So it looks like seven out of 18 of you um, are interested in Morse code. And then Dan is gonna talk a little bit about that and then uh, some other, and it's impossible to um, list out all of the things about ham radio just because there's so many of them. Um, so that's great. Thank you very much for, for taking that poll. Um, Dan, I have you... a question for you. Yeah. How, um, how long do you envision this uh, series of classes to run? We'll, we'll try to let it run throughout this year. Okay. Um, the reason I'm asking is I, I'm, some Thursdays I, I have um, a conflict, not every Thursday, but uh, uh, at least once a month and sometimes twice a month. So okay. I wouldn't necessarily be able to come to all of them. Uh, Wait, yeah. Go Max, ahead. Uh, uh, are you going to record these? I can, yes. Would yes. people be interested in, uh, if we record these, uh, watching them after they happen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And Fair, if you, yeah. cool. And I if was you just going to say that would be a, a good way, you know, for folks who can't attend the meeting, or maybe they missed something, you know, that they wanted to catch up on or, or hear it again, you know. And maybe I don't know. Could we post those on the uh, park website? The link. Yeah. 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 Okay. If you do go to the Portland Amateur Radio Club uh, website, we are posting our um, regular monthly meetings. Um, the videos afterwards. Um, so if you're interested in like what a meeting looks like, uh, w7lt.org uh, will, and under the meetings link, there is the video there. So cool. All right, and thanks. And if you guys take a look at the chat also, there's some information there. We can save the chat. And if you wanna save the chat, the best way to do that in the chat menu, on the right hand side, um, there's a, a three dots and you can click that and you can actually just download the uh, save chat is what it says. All right, so before I turn it over to Dan, I just wanted to point out a couple of resources for people. Um, if you want to, to look at like the Santa Claus catalog, that would be um, Ham Radio Outlet. There are several other um, companies that sell ham radio related gear. This just happens to be one that actually has a physical showroom in um, Tigard, Oregon. Uh, you can always go over there. I believe they've opened it up where uh, a few people can walk around um, to take a look. Uh, but the catalog really is the best way to take a look at what's available for ham radio gear. This is their website. Easy to remember. It's just hamradio.com. They have um, a catalog also that you can uh, download if you go to more and then HRO catalog. You can, there's two different types of catalog. There's a single page and a wide page view. And um, just feel free to uh, click on that and then uh, take a look at the link. We're not sponsored by HRO in any way, um, but uh, it's a great way to just to take a look at what's available. The beginning radio, and I think somebody, was it Sue, uh, 
that mentioned like their first radio, the FT60 um, is a handheld radio that um, has been made by Yesu for at least 15 years. It is a bit long in the tooth. Uh, however, it's been the most recommended radio, I think, by far for a beginning ham radio handheld. It's a dual band. It doesn't cost very much. It's built like a tank. Um, I wouldn't recommend dropping it like any radio. You should not drop. However, uh, it really does take a beating. Um, they do have a newer version of it that does come with uh, digital. It's the FT-70. Um, there have been some complaints about the battery life of the FT-70. Um, and a lot of the buttons uh, and dials are hidden in the menus uh, rather than available um, on the outside. That's why, um, you know, it's up to you kind of like what you want to buy. But the FT-60 is a very decent first-time brand name radio. Um, I'll just comment there that the FT-60 is uh, still kind of the workhorse. Uh, all over the country for emergency communications. Uh, it's pretty rugged. Uh, it's easy to use. And uh, like, for instance, on our net team, I think we've got, you know, about eight or 10 of the folks using our radio, so things are interchangeable. Uh, so the 60 is a good choice for right now, I would, if you're starting out, and then, yeah. you know, explore from there. Most, most of us end up with three or four or five handhelds. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the 60 is kind of the one that you can throw in your, in your bag or your backpack. And, you know, it's always going to work. And uh, you can always, you know, you can get the little uh, accessory pack where you can use, uh, you know, double A batteries. And so it's, it's ex extremely uh, emergency use friendly. Yeah, thank you, Dan. It, somebody else going to comment? Yeah, uh, uh, thanks for the recommendation about the 60. It, it sounds like a great starter radio. What do people tend to gravitate towards for their second radio? I would say for your second radio, a mobile radio would be your best bet. Um, this is something that you can um, either have in your house uh, or put in your car. They do make some uh, like base station um radios that you can use in your house but i would say 98 99 percent of people will just use a mobile radio for their um uh house station uh and that they could even put in their car if they wanted to there are kind of several um different brands different kinds they're all very similar you don't necessarily need to get the most expensive. And that's kind of one of the reasons why we're recommending the FT60 is because at 154, 155, it's um, fairly inexpensive uh, to get into. You don't need something um, that's gonna be, you know, six, $700. Um, at that price point, it's hard to um, take it out into the field uh, just because you're more worried about damaging it than using it. I would give the, the recommendations that I would give uh, is the 70, uh, it's a made by Kenwood. This is just one of them. Um, the TM V71A is a dual band um, mobile radio with a detachable faceplate. Um, you don't have to detach it. I have one of these in the house um, and I just uh, mounted it on a power supply. The mobile radios, they do require 12 volts of power. So you'll need to get a power supply if you don't have one. Um, and it's uh, 50 watts, uh, two meters and uh, 440 megahertz, which are the two most popular bands. Uh, two meters by far being the most popular. Um, oh, Max? Yeah. One alternative instead of getting a power supply is get a, a big 12 volt battery yeah. and put it on a recharger because then in an emergency, you're going to have power. That's a very good point, Herb. Yeah. Yeah. Even if just a, like a lead, lead acid battery, and we can talk about the different types of batteries later, um, but uh, that's a great, great suggestion um, just to get a um, lead acid battery because uh, they're fairly inexpensive. Sometimes you can find them um, uh, used if you are connected with a um, Aries uh, or another emergency 
um, communication group because uh, they'll sometimes collect batteries and hand them out to their members for free. Uh, so that's that's a great suggestion. Thank you. Another um, a good mobile radio made by Yesu is the FTM 400, I think is what they're still called. Yeah. So this is their newer version. It's the uh, FTM 400 XDR. It has a few more bells and whistles on it. Um, honestly, if you're not uh, going to get into APRS and stuff like that. You, this this is certainly not um, the only one that you, that you would need. Again, it's a dual band radio. It does come with a touch screen on it, um, and you can mount this either in your car or in the house. And then for those of you who do have radios, especially mobile radios, is there anything that you like? Is there a favorite? Well, I'm partial to the uh, the FTM 400. It's my first radio I had, other than my Baofeng, and it's very functional. Uh, with the dual bands, you can flip between two different uh, frequencies real easy. Um, it's not bad to program. Um, I I enjoy it. I use it as a base station right now. Yeah, in, in your house. Yep. Just yep. put it up, hooked it up to an external antenna. And with that, I can hit repeaters. I can hit the one in Timber. I can hit Sandy, Forest Grove. On a good day, I can hit Salem um, on the repeaters and things. And uh, on Simplex, I'm getting up as far as Ridgefield and close to Salem. So where, where are you located? I'm in Gresham, right at uh, almost 242nd in Powell. OK, thanks. There are less expensive base stations um, that don't have a lot of the um, extra stuff. Um, they can be had for you know anywhere from uh, 150 to you know to 200 or so. Um, oftentimes they are dual band, but they don't necessarily allow you to listen to both bands at the same time. Um, but that's that's uh, an option. Um, feel free to email me or just ask if you uh, are interested in a lower price point. Uh, now, with the base stations, you definitely would want to use an external antenna, um, and there are many, many external antennas, uh, ones that you can either build uh, for, you know, $10, $20, um, like a J-Pole. Um, there are uh, portable ones that you can just kind of throw up into a tree, um, and then there are more permanent mount ones. And Sue, I think you said that you had one that was a diamond. Yes. X50? Um, look here. It's a, actually, it's a um, diamond. I've, I, I've got the X50 as well. Diamond SRH77CA. It's the one that goes with the um, FT60. And Dan, one of the many nice things he shared was a recommendation <laughs> to get something other than a rubber ducky antenna, which I did. Yeah, so here, here are uh, two um, diamond ones, um, and there are so many uh, external um, antennas. Uh, the ones, I have one of these on the side of my house. Um, these two, the only difference I think is, yeah, is the connector on it. Um, the SO239 connector, uh, which is this right here, is the kind of connector that you will find on uh, most mobile radios and so that's the one that you'd want to get for your mobile radio um, in fact the so that's the connector type that's on the antenna the 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 type that's on the other end where your radio is is called the pl 259 um max i'm gonna yeah. jump in here uh, yeah and make a recommendation for an outside antenna uh that's very effective very inexpensive and supports a good cause and that's the Ed Fong, F-O-N-G. Yeah, Ed Fong uh, is a physics professor at, uh, I think it's UC Berkeley or UC Santa Barbara. And uh, he makes these very nice J-pole uh, type antennas. That's just a type of two meter antenna. There it is. There's the picture of it. 
and uh, they're inexpensive. Uh, they're very durable. Uh, I have one outside my house. He has his grad students <laughs> make those and the money goes to, you know, uh, oftentimes they donate, you know, antennas to various causes. Uh, and they work almost as well, if not better than some of the commercial antennas. And uh, this is a very inexpensive way to get a very nice uh, antenna that you can use outside your house. And uh, here's all the information. You know, if you get a little more serious, then sure, go ahead and get one of the, the diamonds. But if you're just starting out, this is a, a, an excellent choice. Uh, in fact, it can be quite portable, um, you know, should you need to use that. Uh, he makes... This type, which is encased in a PVC pipe, uh, a bunch of us on the net team and so would also have what he calls a roll-up, which is the same antenna, but without the PVC pipe. And it, you just, it just rolls up in a small Ziploc bag and you can throw a rope up into a tree and, and have an instant uh, gain antenna. So there's a couple of really good options for you that, that don't, you know, uh, hit the pocketbook too hard, but are very effective. Yeah, I, I second that. I highly recommend that. If um, it, I he does have a website. I don't know if he actually he wasn't selling them on his website earlier. Um, he actually does sell them directly uh, to people on eBay. Uh, and if you just type in um, Ed Fong and DBJ dash one is the household mount kind, and DBJ dash two is the roll up kind that you can put into a tree. And the great thing about these antennas is that they are dual band. Um, they're very well mm -hmm. constructed and they're actually very easy to mount onto your roof line uh, or a um, like a, a patio or balcony uh, railing. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I was just gonna say, uh, Max, uh, Max and I went down to uh, California to a ham fest uh, called Pacificon. And when did we do that? 2019? Yeah. Yeah. And Max uh, picked up one of Ed's antennas and managed <laughs> to get it on the airplane, despite the fact that it was about five feet long. Yep. <laughs> he took <laughs> it on the plane and flew it back. <laughs> Had to check it, but. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they, that's they got it. Man, but it survived. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So those are my recommendations kind of for uh, at least your first one or two handhelds, um, especially if you're interested in uh, emergency communications. I would say the majority of emergency communications is going to be on the two meter and 440 centimeter band. Um, HF radio does have some emergency communications on it, uh, but generally you have to have your general license or above um, and it just a different radio. So you would just need to invest in, in another radio for that. Um, somebody pointed out, uh, and just for fun, uh, we, we can bring it up, is the 991A. Uh, if you have no um, uh, money uh, issues, um, it is a, a bit expensive at 1129, um, but this is essentially a shack in a box where it will do all the HF uh, bands plus VHF and UHF. Um, great little radio. Uh, it's more of a house radio. Uh, it'd be a little awkward to use in a car. Um, but anyway, that's the Yesu FT-991A. Um, a lot of people ask about the Baofeng radios. Uh, like I said, there's, there's, uh, I find them useful. Um, you probably want to get something else if you're going to be serious about emergency communications, but it's a great first radio just to get started with. Um, unfortunately, it's not easy to program on the radio itself. It's, it's very easy to program with a computer and a cable. Um, and I do recommend going to uh, Baofeng Tech, uh, baofengtech.com. Um, they've been around for quite a while. You can buy these off of eBay, but I know that this company does support uh, what they sell. And they also will do things like they will sell the cable that goes with the radio that actually has um, a non-counterfeit chip in it, making it just a little bit easier to program using your computer. 
And then really quickly, no matter what radio you have, I would highly recommend uh, you can buy um, programming software. However, um, there is some free programming software out there that you can get that works really well. Um, it's called Chirp, C-H-I-R-P. And this guy um, puts out daily um, downloads. Uh, so here's the radios on the, the lower left-hand side that it supports. You can see it supports a ton of radios and he's growing the list every day. Uh, and you can see here that the Baofeng, uh, it, there's quite a big list of radios that it supports. So again, this is free programming software available at, uh, you can just type in Dan Planet Chirp into Google, C-H-I-R-P. And it is just a free download. Um, it takes a little bit of learning to understand how to use it, but any, you know, buddy at the Portland Amateur Radio Club, myself or Dan can help you with the programming. Uh, and one advantage of Chirp is it's uh, 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 Mac, Windows, and Linux. And many of the commercial uh, software is Windows only. So if you're not uh, a fan of Windows, uh, Chirp has an advantage there. You can even just tell it where your, I think your zip code, and then it can kind of help you load the local repeaters into your radio hmm. is kind of one advantage. On cool. that note, can I, can I ask a question just yeah, absolutely. about the last yeah. statement about, so I'm, I've been a lifelong kind of Mac person, but just in general for, for ham radio, is it worth, like, it, will you get as much bang out of the buck I mean, I know like MacCam Radio is you know a website I've been on a few times, but is it worth the investment to just you to just go with a PC for some of the controlling and some of the other things that that are available? Yeah, I'll, and I can have Herb uh, as a Mac user kind of chime in. I would say in the past, um, the vast majority of ham radio software is. Uh, either Windows only or it's available on Windows, which is why if you want to get into things like um, uh, WinLink, which is kind of like the electronic uh, passing back and forth messages, uh, unfortunately, the really only good solution is on Windows. So a lot of people, a lot of ham radio people, if they're, if they're really Mac people, they'll end up just buying kind of a more inexpensive laptop because the, the vast majority of Windows-based ham radio software is um, doesn't take a lot of processing power. So a laptop that is four or five, six years old uh, can still run uh, the ham radio software very easily. There is more stuff that is running on Macintosh. Um, unfortunately, it's just like, I guess the, the you know, building um, software for the Windows PC or the Windows platform has in the past been easier uh, and less expensive. So that's kind of where the majority of the ham radio software is. Um, one thing to keep in mind is some of the Windows software uh, will work under something like Parallels on a Mac. It depends on whether it needs custom drivers or not. Because if it needs custom drivers, often the drivers are problematic in a virtual machine. Okay, thanks. Yeah, great question, David, thank you. Any other questions from people about either radios, software, programming? Max, I had a question for you. You, you mentioned the, the mobile radios. Is, is that something where you can easily use it in your house and then put it in a car? You can, you can move them back and forth? You can. Um, okay. Yeah, so uh, I, if you install it in your car, which is one option, is to basically just take a radio um, like the... Uh, like the FTM 400... Um, and install it in your car. Um, but most people, if they want a, a home station, they just use a mobile, just because there's so many more options out there and the, the price is a lot more reasonable. Um, base stations, especially the two meter 440 megahertz base stations, it's hard to find anything under a thousand dollars. Whereas a mobile station, it's easy to find something anywhere from 200 to 800 or more 
um, with the average price probably being around 300. Um, that's kind of what I would recommend is if you're looking for a home base station, go with a mobile radio. Um, you wouldn't necessarily want to then transfer this from your house to your car to your house um, just because of the electrical and the antenna connections. Um, eventually, uh, you may want to consider installing a mobile radio in your car on, on kind of on a permanent basis. The only other option would be to put it in like what they call a go kit, uh, which would be like either a, some type of Pelican case um, that you could transfer it from your house to your car. Although I have a, a go kit that's really good. I just, it's kind of awkward still to transfer it. So eventually it's just better to buy one for the car and one for the house. Okay. And uh, just a comment, it depends whether you want one for your car because you want to use it while you're driving around or whether you want one for your car because if you have to go uh, somewhere else and you want to be able to use it. So for example, uh, if you are, are just going to get a mag mount antenna that you can stick on your roof, you probably wouldn't want to use that when you're driving, but when you're stopped, you can just run your antenna cable out the window, hook it to a mag mount on the roof. And uh, so it doesn't take a lot of effort to uh, move your mobile radio from your home to your car. And I'm the crazy guy that uh, when I do that, I, I put a tripod and antenna in my trunk. And when I get to my destination, I set it up on the sidewalk and cable it into my car. Yeah, that's so a good point, you, Bruce. Do you mainly just get, when, you, when you're looking for a base station, is that mainly just for HF? Is that what you would focus on for a base station then? Well, uh, yeah. So for a base station that's not VHF, so an HF radio, um, there's all different uh, kinds and flavors. Um, Dan and I are very particular about um, a uh, HF radio called Elcraft. Mm. This is kind of like the gold standard Cadillac uh, HF radio. They um, sell something that looks like this, which is their, their newest edition, the, the K4. Um, but then they also sell uh, something that they call the um, K, KX2 and the KX3. And if I take a look at, if we take a look at the KX2 transceiver, this is an HF transceiver um, that is uh, 80 through 10 meters. Uh, that's right, yeah, 80 through 10 meters. And essentially it's small enough that you can hold it in your hand uh, with one hand. Um, it's not inexpensive, but HF radios in general are not inexpensive. Um, you'll definitely, before you invest in an HF radio, uh, you definitely wanna just kind of do a little bit of homework, talk to a lot of people, go see a lot of them in person if you can, um, or just do some research on the internet. But yeah, that's a great um, question. Uh, actually, to to kind of get to that point, most of the people, if you after a while you become serious, you'll probably end up with both an HF and a VHF yes. radio for your home. Um, you know, but it doesn't. Your VHF radio for home does not have to be an expensive. Uh, it can be an older used mobile radio, uh, and actually, if you get a really good outdoor antenna. Excuse me. Uh, you know, you can use your handheld uh, inside the house by running the cable. And I would actually recommend that first before you go out and buy, you know, a mobile radio. Uh, because as you get into the hobby and kind of figure out what it is that you're interested in, uh, invariably uh, your interests are going to change and you're going to get a better sense of what it is you need to buy. So, uh, you know, just I, and I'll do that even with my uh, FT60, you know, I'll just hook it to the outside antenna and it's uh, extremely effective uh, because the antenna uh, is probably 90%. The radio is about 10%. And that, that also goes for HF. Yep. Yeah. Guys, thank you, Dan. I, thank I you agree guys. with yeah. that, Dan. Um, but we, we need to be a little careful because the first time I tried that was with the Baofeng and 
the receiver went dead, even though it transmitted better. Oh. Um, yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> or, but if you spend over $100 for a handheld, then adding that antenna can make great sense. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the problem with the bow fangs uh, is basically they can become overloaded with a lot of signals. Uh, but if you're talking something like a, the ASU FT60 or another uh, brand name handheld, uh, connecting it to an outside antenna, uh, I, I think you'll find a, a lot of usefulness. Good, good point, Bruce. Yeah, that's that's good to, to go over that. <laughs> yeah, Dan brings up a really good point as far as like before you buy a mobile radio, even one for your car. Um, I, <laughs> funny story. Uh, I've been in this hobby for over 30 years. I still have yet to, to install one in my car mm -hmm. uh, I, because of two reasons. I have a, a, a go kit that I can use in my car if I want to. And the second reason is because um, most of the time I actually just use my handheld radio and a mag mount antenna on my car and it works fairly well if i don't have to like get uh, out of like if i'm not in the middle of the wilderness if i'm downtown portland or, or just anywhere around the portland area i can easily hit a lot of the repeaters just using my handheld and a mag mount antenna like the one that you see um here this is a diamond uh it's fairly small um you and um I don't know if it's best practice, but I just uh, take the coax cable and route it into the back uh, driver's side door, uh, and then just very carefully close the door on the um, the cable itself. Um, it's I don't open that door very often, so the cable lasts a very long time, um, and it's fairly inexpensive at twenty seven dollars uh, for a mag mount antenna. And I would definitely try that first before you buy a, a mobile radio that you install in your car. One of the things I suggest if you're gonna hook up a handheld to a coax is get a little, uh, I'm gonna call it a pigtail. Mm -hmm. It's about oh, six, eight inches long. It'll have a connector that fits your, your uh, handheld and then whatever you have for a coax connector. And it's very, very flexible. If you hook up the any kind of a very stiff coax to the handheld, you may damage the connection on the handheld. And they're like $10 or so. You can buy them either on eBay in a package. You can get a whole bunch of different adapters. HRO has them at the counter. Uh, HRO is open last I heard. I was out there a couple of weeks ago, and they were limiting like four or five people in the store at any one time. But they were that, yeah that's a great point because the um the intent the the thicker coax cables will put some stress on the handheld connector um so these little things will take a lot of the stress off um if you don't have a mag mount antenna this uses a smaller coax uh the i think it's the um, rg uh, 174 um, so it's thinner to start with, so you wouldn't need that pigtail. But if you do have or buy another type of mag mount antenna, these are great to have. Sometimes they're necessary anyway, because you'll see that this uh, adapts it from a um, uh, PL259 to an SMA connector. And a lot of the more modern radios, including the FT60, use that uh, gold connector that you see on the right hand side, the uh, SMA connector. Uh, uh, Max, I was going to jump in here uh, just yeah. because I'm going to have to run fairly quick. And yep. I know there were some questions about HF and soda. So I thought if I could, if I could kind of jump in here and just give a quick um, yep. Dan, talk yeah, and about that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I see it's uh, already 721. I'll let you, uh, yeah. Dan, I'll have you close it out. Um, again, uh, just one last thing before I turn it over to Dan. Um, I'll schedule this for next Thursday at uh, 6 o'clock, and we'll give that a try. We can record them, and I'll, I'll figure out a way to, to post these. Uh, if you have any questions, just please send me an email, um, and that's it. Thank you, for everybody, for joining, and Dan, take it away. So, uh, Matt, okay. is, yeah. 
is the uh, link that you gave me to put on the website going to change? No, so the link, uh, oh, actually, no, that's a very good point. Yes, the link, unfortunately, will have to change if so we change why it to Thursday. You, why don't you email me when you have a new link and I'll update the website. Okay, thank you very much, yeah, for reminding me. Um, and so what'll happen is the link will, will remain the same throughout the year uh, starting next week. Um, you'll just need to re-register for the night that you want to come. You feel free to register any, you know, you know, a few minutes before you come uh, or a few days, it doesn't matter. Um, okay, Max, I don't know if you can stick around. I might ask yeah. you to put up a few slides. Um, real quick, for those who are not familiar, um, you know, ham radio from its beginning, which is over 100 years ago, actually, up until, you know, 1950s, 60s, 70s, was almost exclusively what we call HF or shortwave radio. Uh, and uh, that still is a big component of, of the radio and of interest to a lot of us. That's a personal interest of mine. Uh, so I, I also uh, do a great deal with Morse code, which uh, many people thought had died out. And in fact, it became dropped uh, is an examination element. It used to be required. And of course, everybody said, oh, as soon as you get rid of Morse code, that's the death of ham radio. That was the old timers. Uh, funny thing, Morse code is now more popular than ever. <laughs> and I'm teaching classes in it. Uh, and there's many other resources. Uh, anyway, uh, and, uh, there's, there's a lot of fun aspects to the HF equipment. Uh, I'll, I'll just show you a quick picture here in a minute. I've got all kinds of HF radios here in my house. Uh, but one of the things that I particularly enjoy doing is getting outside and uh, taking small portable HF radios. Uh, and the, the activity that uh, one of the other people was referring to earlier is called SOTA, which is Summits on the Air. And it started as a European or English program. And basically what it is, is uh, you're, you're taking your radio and, and climbing up to as high a spot as you possibly can and putting up a portable radio. Uh, but it also includes uh, VHF and UHF. Uh, and a ton of people are doing that. And uh, the, the fun part about this uh, is it's the perfect uh, preparedness for emergency situations. And it's fun. Uh, you know, to me, sometimes the emergency preparedness stuff gets so serious that it's kind of like, oh, you know, a little bit of the proper doomsday kind of a thing. Uh, I think radio should be fun. And I think it should be fun to get outside and enjoy, you know, the outdoors. And plus you get all this preparation for taking a radio and doing something portable with it. And uh, so to me, that just makes a, a, a fun combination. Um, I, I can go on and on about <laughs> the, whole, the whole program. And <laughs> I've, I've drugged Max to some locations <laughs> and, and we've had some fun. Uh, this, uh, you know, HF radios used to be huge. And I'll show you some of those. This entire package is a completely equipped uh, high frequency shortwave radio that I can take, a complete with antenna, battery, and everything. And uh, that's often what I take. Uh, as opposed to this, which I still use for fun. Let's see if we can uh, see this here. I'll, I'll turn it around. Hopefully, you can see this. Uh, some of these radios uh, from the 1950s and 1940s uh, that are gigantic tube radios. <laughs> and I do use these, and they're a lot of fun. Okay. Uh, is there any questions so far? You know, because I've kind of thrown a bunch of stuff at people. I'd just like to comment that along with SOTA is POTA, which is part oh, sure. of the air. Yes, 
Yeah, you know, if 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 you don't want to climb vertically, you can you can walk horizontally <laughs> and get to the parks. And there's a whole program with activating state parks and all kinds of. And it's a very similar kind of thing, and that's a lot of fun. Uh, so there's there's a whole bunch of these activities uh, that you can get into that are that are fun. I uh, get you outdoors, get you some exercise, which my doctor loves. And uh, <laughs> uh, also gives you a really good leg up on emergency preparedness uh, because you're, you're interested in traveling uh, with lightweight equipment and setting it up in, in you know, achieving communications. Can I ask you a quick question, Dan? Sure, yeah. So you go somewhere and you set up your radio, such as right. Clear Lake, um, Fire, yeah, look at, totally. fire lookout, and then yeah. you're you're trying to make contact with somebody. Yes. And exactly. how do you know who you're trying to contact? This is a really simple question, but <laughs> no, no, no. That's actually a great question. Uh, typically, what happens uh, is you post in advance, uh, you know, through an app or through a website. You say, "I'm going to be at you know Clear Lake View, you know, between this time." And, you know, then people are alerted. And those are called the chasers. So ah. they're chasing you. Aha, yes. In fact, I think we had a gentleman on here that was a chaser. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I work people all over the world. And, you know, with extremely low power and portable radios. Um, and if you just... If you're just doing VHF and UHF, there's a ton of activity. You don't even have to mess with the HF until you get interested in that later. Um, so for, for instance, uh, tomorrow, New Year's Eve, uh, there's a bunch of soda activations uh, within about a 30 or 40 mile radius of Portland. And if you turn on your radio uh, to 14658, one four six five eight. Uh, odds are you'll hear them, and all you have to do is send your call sign. What event is that, Dan? Uh, soda. Uh, okay. There's a whole bunch of soda oh, activations right. over the new year. Yeah, yeah. And it's usually yeah. between uh, like three and six or PM. Yeah. I mean, uh -huh. yeah. okay. Yeah. With a lot of activity happening like between four and five, because that's the changeover. Correct. Okay. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. cool. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so, you know, you can probably step outside with your handheld and your antenna and probably hear a bunch of the guys uh, because they're going to be at high elevations. So they're going to have a natural advantage uh, for transmitting and receiving. And, uh, you know, a lot of them have specialized antennas that they may be using to even uh, generate more activity. Uh, but it's just, you know, it's just another way to have some fun with the radios. And, and like I said to me, uh, you know, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you know, let's put some fun into the emergency preparedness thing instead of all being just totally serious. And the soda thing, it, uh, like as it happens worldwide, it's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, people get into it. It's just an enjoyable activity. I think that'll be one of our, our future topics very soon. Uh, yeah. Just we'll, kind of talking we'll, we'll about. In, yeah. In depth. You could, yeah. With soda, like Dan said, you don't have to, to get your general license. You can very easily go uh, just use your handheld um, and just make a lot of contacts. Yeah. Yeah. And have fun. Yeah, yeah. I drug uh, Max and his uh, five pound steel plate up, yeah. you know, a two mile hike uphill <laughs> to the Clear Lake Butte fire lookout. But we still had a lot of fun. We had a good time. <laughs> Thank yeah. you very much, then, Dan. Oh, sure. go ahead. No, that was it. I was just going to say uh, one of the other activations that you and I went on was. Uh, which one is that? Green Mountain? Yeah. The, yeah, the where long I got hike lost. in the fog. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I hacked up and took the wrong turn and then <laughs> I found you guys. 
Yeah, ham radio oh, well. today, uh, because of the size of the electronics, uh, it's very easy to mix both ham radio and outdoors. Uh, so it's a great time to get into ham radio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not this well, week, unless you like to get wet. True. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, you know. Yeah. You know, I'm 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 kind of a fanatical golfer, so I go out in the rain and the cold and and walk. So you know, a little a little adverse weather doesn't bother me much, and I I look at it as a challenge. And a lot of the guys are into cross country skiing and snowshoeing, uh, so they'll they'll do that as well with the radios. And they get bonus points. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so. cool. Well, thank you very much, Dan. And thanks for everybody sure. else for coming. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email them to me uh, and you can kind of address them next time. Um, uh, or Dan, I'll get Dan's email up here uh, very soon. Yeah. And then uh, I'll, I'll see you guys next week if you can make it next Thursday at 6. Thanks, Max. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Learned a lot, you guys. Thank you. Thank Happy you. New Year. Cool. All right. Yeah. Good session. Appreciate it. See you next week.